Hi guys, uh, thank you for being here today. I will. Uh, looks like you guys are all settled down. Um, people in the back, you wanna sit down or anything? Before standing, okay, that's cool. Also, um, I'm setting up a link here so that you guys can ask questions as we go along. So you, you don't have to like raise your hands or anything. We'll answer all these at the end. If there are any questions, if not, then uh, then good also. So it's something new I'm trying also. I never used that uh, Google que uh, Google Slides question thing before, but uh, you kind of get to vote on stuff too, so I guess that's fun. Um, okay. I am Lee. I am currently uh, functioning as the head of product at Tech in Asia. Um, interesting thing, I last Saturday was actually my two and a half year anniversary at the company. It's been a while. It's been so uh, these are the topics that I, re I really want to touch on today. So really, how um, my my own my how 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 I want to share my personal experiences as an engineer and then becoming a product manager over time, and then how our product actually changed as well during that journey. Then I want to share a bit on what Tech in Asia is uh, ten uh, tending to tackle for 2017. Okay, a little bit of background, um, just to establish some uh, rapport here with you guys. I studied computer science. <laughs> Hi, Steph. Um, studied computer science uh, at UCLA. That was uh, probably uh, seven, eight years ago, more than that. Um, good times, actually, because LA has a lot to offer, uh, food, fun, and friends. So that, that was actually uh, one of the uh, best parts of my life, actually. Okay, then next, right, I, I started working at this company called LifeCrowd after I graduated. Sadly, we're not online anymore, but it is here that I spent uh, time honing my craft, picking up skills uh, that I needed to become a better software engineer. Then, we actually pivoted a few times. So the first, this is not the, the, the you know final iteration at all. Um, we actually uh, started with baby products, then we uh, did daily deals, somewhat something like Groupon actually. Uh, then we moved on to social activities. Um, in the short like pitch, right? This actually uh, we actually connected subject matter experts with people who wanted to uh, learn more about them, as well as like kind of just hang out and have fun at the same time. Uh, after this, we moved from LA to Chicago, and we pivoted to. Uh, do commercial uh, residential services actually so things like uh, dry cleaning cleaning a house and all that stuff all right you might be thinking why am I showing you a picture of Tillborough bakery this is at Raffles City so short story um, after I came back from the States uh, to Singapore but mainly because of family I applied to an engineering position at TIA that was where I also met Willis uh, actually, we met here, so more than two years ago. Um, and at this place, he shared his grand vision of where he saw the company in the next few years. And I found common ground with him, and so I joined. So first joined as an engineer. I actually worked together a lot with Lester, uh, Lester Chan. He's a very prominent blogger in you know Singapore, maybe the world, and. Actually, he's more well known for being a WordPress plugin developer. So at that time, right, Tech in Asia was actually hosted on uh, VPS on DigitalOcean. It was it was ov overloaded bad actually. And when I first joined, we had to solve these problems. And luckily enough for us, Softly actually offered us uh, a year of free uh, hosting. So that kind of worked out pretty well. We tried out their hardware solutions because we thought that would hardware would be you know really quick and really fast but later we would find out that that would be somewhat of a problem also but I will share in the next uh, slide. Um, once we iron out our hardware issues right we were able to focus on our product at that time so you might be curious to find out what actually failed with this thing called TIA Insights so we thought that premium content would appeal to our users so we had a subscription service where we had a digital magazine, we had long-form content that uh, our users could actually sign in through a paywall 
and then you know consume that content. But you know we were wrong. Our our revenue numbers told us a different story from what we expected, and we had to cut our losses at the time. You know we had to refund people all their you know money, and then we had to make a very difficult decision to just stop doing that. Um, things uh, went. More interesting for us in 2015, actually. So in the first four months of the year, we uh, our company got into YC into the YC program, Y Combinator program in San Francisco. So uh, Willis, our founder, he went there for four months. Um, we focused our efforts on TechList, uh, one of our one of the new products we had at the time. So it was actually a startup and investor database. So we were actually spending a lot of effort in the first four months working on that. By the end of the program in April, we were quite sure that it was something that we wanted to focus on. However, we faced two issues. First thing is that the engineering team at the time was based in Vietnam. Secondly, the uh, product was written on an entirely different stack, as you can see that Rails and MongoDB. So. We deliberated for quite a while between uh, myself, Lester, and, and Willis. We made a very, very, very difficult decision to scale the engineering team in Singapore instead. You know, of course, you know what that means, right? You know. <laughs> um, so we took the next three to four months to basically rewrite everything from scratch. So we moved from Ruby on Rails to PHP. Because uh, we technology.com is actually on PHP, so it, from an engineering point of view, it made sense for us to have uh, all our code bases in PHP, and then we moved from MongoDB to MySQL. So we wrote a whole uh, long script just to migrate data that way. So By that, that, yes. That make sense, why do you want to migrate from Rails to PHP? What was the great difference between that? Good the question. Difference Perhaps I can shed some light on that. Um, simple for us, for, for me, right, it was more of a manpower issue. In Singapore, we wanted to move our engineering headquarters to Singapore because that's where all the uh, product decisions were made, uh, higher level decisions were made. So hiring Ruby on Rails at the time to me was, was not easy. It was easier for us to find PHP developers. Yeah, if people like Rails, like Ruby is not a particular digital language to learn. So, and hiring people who are not willing to learn it, regardless of if they're using PHP or Rails, it's not very smart to see. So you anyway to uh, find people who are ready to learn. So it doesn't matter if it's like Ruby or PHP. Mm. I would agree with you actually, but here's here's another point for um, to think about. Um, at that time, our Rails uh, uh, that it was using about 200 over gems. And so it was really slow, and it was kind of monolithic, and it was. We thought that it would be very difficult to scale Rails that way, because it seemed to be able to only scale like vertically, whereas we wanted to scale horizontally. So this this was also a, uh, a reason why we chose to move it. Okay, but then it has nothing to do with Rails. It has to do with like decision made uh, technically. Yes, it's correct. So, so it's still uh, you can reuse more Ruby if you can. Correct. Okay, then finally, one more thing I can share with you is that both both Lester and myself, right? We are PHP. Uh, we started PHP, so that's what we are most familiar with. So I guess that that also plays a part in our decision. Yeah, and you manager, an engineer, so it matter. yeah at, at the time I was still a uh, engineer. And you didn't want to go learn Ruby. Uh, I actually did uh, contribute to that code base. So I, I actually I know all the inner workings and how it works, and I know that there's a lot of uh, legacy code in there, stuff that we did not want. So we cut a lot of features as well in TechList. So when we migrated, we took the best parts of it, and we just rewrote the parts that we needed. So we cut a lot of fat in that process. We can finish here, but you actually didn't yet justify it, like this migration. Like it's a big piece of job work, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, without, without any apparent reasons, like mm. any. Okay, um, fair enough. But I, I would just, you know, say that you know we made these decisions based on uh, country, like geographical reasons, wanting uh, engineering headquarters to be in Singapore, and in, and for future also, uh, being able to hire engineers who know PHP and myself and Lester knowing PHP more. 
So it was a combination of these factors. So I, uh, that, that worked for us, actually. And looking back, it was a good decision. Ho hopefully that uh, someone answers your questions. So in the same year, we scaled our team to seven engineers. And then we had enough manpower to uh, work on improving our infrastructure and our front end. So we uh, do AWS and React. Today, we are still on AWS and still using React. Okay, 2016 was a year of many changes for myself personally. We started building our data infrastructure and pipeline. We expanded our product offerings uh, by launching TIA Tech and Asia Jobs. So both are very, very, very huge undertakings and to this day we are actively still working on them. But it was a turning point for me as I started conducting more user research sessions and to be honest, I had to choose to stop coding as I spent more time actually talking with users and uh, conducting research. So you can't really, I, I couldn't really like, you know, step on two boards at the same time. And I had many talks with uh, Willis, our founder at the time, to kind of like, okay, say, this is, are you sure this is something you want to do? Are you sure this, you want to give up on coding to focus more on product? So I, I had to make a very active, uh, play an active role in this decision, actually. Then we scaled the team after that so that product and engineering focus on different parts of our product development cycle. To me, this is my primary concern today and actually from last year. So users, remember how we failed in 2014 with uh, Technology Insights? We built a product that we thought our users wanted, um, but that, that obviously didn't work out so well, right? So today, how do we know how, uh, what, what our users want? We, we do research. So very, very shortly, research. But if I want to touch a bit more on it, uh, we did not actually have a very good research process at Technasia early last year. We spent a lot of time uh, learning from books, online resources, and other companies. So this, this whole process took a few months, actually. Uh, it was mostly uh, Willis and myself. We took, uh, actually, mostly him. You know, he took a lot of initiative to find out about things that he did not know, and, and we actually picked up a lot of things on the way. So we had to make a call on a certain direction that we want to take the product in. Then we would talk to our users to find out uh, what they actually thought. So we have a hypothesis, right, in, in a certain like design thing or feature or direction that you want to go in. So you formulate prototypes and then you ask people about it. So funny thing, right, when, when you share a prototype with people, sometimes they can say one thing, yet do another. So um, TLDR, how do you really know what they really think when you know, they say one thing and do another? I would say you really have to put yourself in their shoes, kind of empathize with them, where they're coming from, then, you know, you can actually detect a certain behavior, a certain pattern in their behavior, then that's what you use to make a decision of. I know this is, uh, I, I'm kind of like hand waving a little bit, but there's a lot more that goes into this which I will not be covering today. All right, so to me, research is just one part of being a good product manager. When, when hiring a product manager today, these are all the things that I look at as well. So domain expertise, communication skills, these are important also. But for technical knowledge, I think coming from like an engineering background, this, this gives me an advantage in certain things. So two, actually, that I'm going to talk about. First thing is knowing how to code uh, allows me to write SQL, right? Then that allows me to you know, access database directly, put the numbers I want, uh, do my own analysis. So that actually like, kind of takes out the middleman. In, in most cases, I can just pull data and uh, you know, move the process along quicker. Second thing, speaking the same language as engineers um, you know, allows you to empathize with them more. Right? You, you understand their pain points, 
what kind of requirements they want, and why they think things should be done a certain way. But of course, I understand there are disadvantages too. So personally, I'm guilty of one thing, uh, the, the biggest thing, I think it's uh, of being too myopic. So knowing technical limitations sometimes limits my own creativity. So I would be, I would be, you know, so sometimes trying to, okay, think about, okay, one example, let's say if you're building an undo feature, it, in engineering terms, right, it would mean that we need to uh, maybe allow soft deletes, we need to lock previous states and all that stuff. But it would be easy to think like, oh man, you know, that's so much work. Is it worth the time? Is it worth the effort actually building that? So I might be like, okay, like maybe I'll use this, donate this, and then just, you know, sweep it under the rug. But, you know, thinking, from, thinking for our users, if that's something that has been requested many, many times through email feedback or whatever, then actually you might want to take a look at that. So that's, that's how I, I see it. Um, so for 2017, I face, today I face a very different set of challenges. Our team faces a very different set of challenges. Um, and I would like to you know, touch a little bit on it. So today we have three different product offerings, um, media, our media side, uh, jobs arm, and, and of course our events, uh, conferences side. So I think the challenge for us today is finding a common design language for all these uh, product offerings, yet um, having it, uh, having the branding tied together so that people still understand that we are we are tech in Asia. Secondly, um, making decisions based on data. This we have been struggling with this issue ever since we uh, made a very key hire last year. Collecting data is difficult. Analyzing large amounts of data even more difficult. And we wish to use this data actually to fit into our recommendation engines, to, fit in, uh, to be able to recommend good content for our users. But it has been very hard to hire good help in this area, as well as uh, ensuring like data coming in from various sources is clean, and how you're gonna dissect that data, you know. That, that has still been a challenge for us. Uh, thirdly, we, Technasia has always been predominantly uh, web-heavy kind of product, but we do have our Android and iOS apps, and it is also another challenge for us to differentiate ourselves in terms of like how do we make our mobile app attractive enough for people to want to download it and use it on their phones. Lastly, uh, very. Uh, a thing that you should always be thinking about, constantly reading, learning, and improving, especially uh, with uh, your own skills as well as processes in the company. Okay, I am actually at the end of uh, what I wanted to share. I, I think if you guys have any questions, I'll be very, very, very happy to answer them. Um, so let's take a look at what we have. Okay, I think there are no questions, so anyone just want to raise your hands? Yeah? Uh, do you see going from engineering to product as a one-way jump? So do you plan to ever go back to being an engineer? Good question. So for me personally, I think I am happy where I am right now. Having, having spent about more than a year in product, I have actually given up a lot in terms of keeping up with the latest trends, especially front-end development nowadays. It's so much JavaScript and that, that itself, how you build your packages and all, that moves too fast for me. So it's something that I cannot keep up with actually. So when our engineers start to talk about uh, things that doing to optimize build times and why they're doing certain things, I'm actually like, ooh, you know, way out there. So I, okay, I kind of just encapsulate that, okay, that's not me anymore. You know, so I, I focus on what I do better today, right? Like talking to my uh, users, understanding them, doing research, you know, uh, looking at numbers, that kind of stuff. So I think that these skills, right, they are very uh, transferable, you know, understanding people, looking at numbers. So I, I, it, might, it might be possible that I go back to engineering one day, 
but I see myself on this path for now. Yes? You said that it was challenged to know what was the main things when you had to use your products. So what was the final solution? How do you know this behavior? There are a few things we do actually uh, during our tests. So first, being prepared and knowing what you want to find out. That's, that's key. So, for example, let's say, you know, you're redesigning a site, which you are doing right now. Um, you want to you wanna have a purpose in mind, right? Maybe the goal is to allow users to read your content more easily. So everything you design, your, your, your experiment, should be around this hypothesis. And then, so, you, when you execute a plan, you must be very clear about okay what are the questions you want to ask him, how will this question help in you understanding what's he, what he's thinking about this. Sometimes you also don't want to ask too direct questions because that would you know set a bias. Okay, good question. So we, we, we do talk with actual users. We invite them to our office. It's like, uh, talking to groups. Yes, uh, usually it's conducted like one on one, so one one user at a time. So we have a team of uh, maybe engineer, product manager, and designer sitting in together with uh, our user, but the product manager would be the one running the show. So uh, going through the script, asking questions, showing the uh, prototype that we have prepared in advance. So like you click here, you go to here, you click here, go to there, you know, that kind of stuff. So when we conduct this. Uh, uh, experiments or research or interview, many different words for the same thing. But we we actually try to observe uh, micro expressions as best as you can, the way they talk, their tone of voice, um, body language, stuff like that. So sometimes when they click on something, you'll see like their eyes kind of like open a bit wider, but there's no sound from them actually. But you kind of notice that, and you know, you might want to ask them like. What made you so? You know, what made you? Uh, what made you think twice about that? What made you spend some time thinking about that? And usually, you can get pretty good uh, answers like that. I hope that answers this question. How many? T oh, okay, good question too. Um, we, my, I like personally. I like to talk to three people. In for, for that uh, one series of tests that we're doing. I think three people allows us to find a pattern in behavior already. So but you need to define the focus group first. Yes, correct. So for example, if we are building our jobs uh, redesign right, for our, let's say, employers, then we would ideally get people who are actively hiring. Then when they come down, uh, maybe not three, maybe in this, cert like, depends on the stage of the test, right? We run, like, tests, like, maybe three to four rounds of tests, and each round has, like, three people, right? But nearer to the end, we want to m be really sure, so we will, we will ask, like, three to four, maybe five people even for the same round, just to be very, very sure. Yeah, and, we, and of course, we will ask, you know, the right, you know, demographic. You don't want to ask, you know, X or Y, you know? Yeah. Yes, hi. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, right now, for TIA jobs, uh, what's the biggest challenge you have? <laughs> <laughs> TIA jobs, so many challenges. Biggest challenge. What's the one that's most intriguing? Intriguing. Oh, there, there are different things. <laughs> but I can touch on both, all right. So, biggest challenge, right? Of course, it's getting more users uh, on board our platform. So how we handle it could be through like product, or tr could be through marketing efforts. So that's that's always like the end goal, right? The KPI you wanna get more users. So I would say that's the biggest challenge. What's intriguing to me is okay. So it mo that something that relies more on data, so more on machine learning. So. We are also building this uh, premium service for jobs called community recruiting. And it's kind of a replacement for the traditional re uh, recruit recruitment uh, way of finding talents for your company. So we, we do act 
as a recruiter as well, but we use data to make those decisions. So I think using our data to make smarter decisions within the team itself, that would be very challenging and intriguing to me. We are also using the same system to recommend jobs and people to our users as well. So this, is, this part, very intriguing, but very challenging. Did you have a follow-up question before? Cool. So when you do research, user uh, research for products like TIA Yep. Uh, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that a lot of uh, different kind of user groups, for example, like there are the job posters and there's the job applicants. How do you balance or how do you prioritize? Because uh, you take the case of the so sometimes what the job posters want might not be one of the applicants. <laughs> Good point. Good point. So, what we have is a marketplace issue, right? There are two sides of the coin. Some people, I mean, I've, I've heard of uh, some people talking before, and sometimes you have to like fake one side to get, you know, traffic on the other side. So, fortunately for us, right, we did not have to fake, you know, data uh, uh, so much or at all, really. We just help. We just we were more active in this role. We looked for employers who wanted to hire, and you know, if you're gonna help them do things, they're just gonna say yes. You know, so in that way, right, we can solve one side of the uh, equation by helping our employers, you know, our uh, startups out there post jobs on our platform. So, uh, but to answer your question, we have this thing internally that we call a HXC. Some of you might have heard of this concept before. It's an abbreviation for High Expectation Customer. I think you can read about it on Medium or something. People, uh, people wrote about that, right? So what we do is we have uh, our product marketers uh, helping us out with that. So they would actually conduct uh, a research, a very focused research into just job seekers and another one into just employers. So how it, how, it, what, how we did it is in two phases. First, we sent out a general survey to identify like who's having problems with our, our system, right? Then you know, they would share with you like, okay, I kind of like this, I don't like this, you know, like that. From this group of people, you find the people who, uh, based on their responses, you know that they are going to be people who are going to be very demanding, who are going to be very vocal about stuff. And then you kind of like, take them out of that list, then you conduct another survey to really drill into what are the pain points that affect them. So the theory for HXC is that this, uh, these people are very, have very high expectations, right? So like me, these are also the people who really care for your product, they really want to use it, they might be uh, good uh, advocates in the future. So as long as you solve this, uh, the problems for this group of people, you're going to solve the problems for people who don't have such high expectations as well. So that's how we kind of attack you know, the problem, by targeting each group separately, then digging into those uh, areas. So far, we have not had this problem, actually. Um, we've found very, very consistently that people want to know what's up with their job application process. They want to know clearly what's the salary involved, they want to know uh, what's it like working at the company and it, there's employers may not be willing to share this information at first, you know some companies, Asian companies tend to like want to not put salary there but I think when they find out or they know or we educate them about the benefits and why job seekers want this right, I think there's no argument there. Yes? Um, question is about uh -huh. Seems like as a product manager, you're doing a lot of the UX stuff, right? Um, are there so when you're conducting a user research thing, do you have UX designers with you? And if so, then how does the where's the line, right? How do you work with them? Every company, I think, has a different style of doing this. For us, we we have one person who does UI and UX for us together. So. Her role is, you know, I don't know, you are UX designer. Um, so 
usually what we would do as product managers, right, in the team currently today, is that we would kind of draw wireframes of like how we expect certain things to be, you know, what's the flow like, and uh, what, you know, overall, what, what, what are we working to solve. So with these high level objectives and, uh, you know, wireframes in mind, then our designer is able to translate that into a design language consistent with our, uh, uh, you know, pretty it with a design language consistent with our site. And she actually applies all the styles to it. So that's, that's the way we draw a line at Tech in Asia. And she's also included in the UTs. So usually, like I said, one product manager, one designer, and one engineer. The role of the designer, when, when she goes in there, right, is to, you know, people, when people see nice design, they say it, right, you know, and it feels good for her to be there and to understand what people think about that. Also, it's also good for her to receive, like, uh, you know, constructive feedback on why, why certain things are, like, you know, there's so much white space or this thing is, you know, kind of cramped. And lastly, you know, the engineer is also there because frequently, what, what, what I've noticed that they are usually, you know, in some way, right, at the end of the chain, right, you go through all this research, you think about all these things, then finally, it reaches the engineer's hands and they're like, what is this? Why, 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 why do I have to build this thing, you know? Can I build it my way? Like, I think doing this a certain way is better. So we found that having an engineer in there helps, helps, helps them empathize with the problems that we're trying to solve. They see the user clicking, being frustrated, and that, then there's no argument anymore about why we need to build a certain feature a certain way. Like, can you spend one more day like, so that we have this undo feature for the users? Then when they see users doing that, wait, wait, why can't I do this? Then, you know, no arguments there also. Just, okay, I think, I think it's important for our users, uh, quoted from our engineers. <laughs> <laughs> can I yeah, please. So, um, so then what happens after that? When you're done with your user research stuff, um, you sit down, who do you sit down with after that and try to come up with insights and then build your product? Yes, you are actually right. We have a debrief session after every round. Everyone kind of just throws the observations out. Then we, uh, we either write it down on a whiteboard somewhere. Then we go through and say, uh, which problems are the ones worth solving? We kind of like, maybe we vote, maybe we discuss. Then we pick like things that we want to fix. Then we iterate. Yes, uh, this guy? This guy in uh, black. Probably for the fourth stage, that if I would ask my users what like what they need, I will be bringing uh, faster courses, not building cars. Aren't you afraid that this way you actually locking yourself up from uh, innovations that you? Uh, could you say easy. your first part again? I missed it a little bit. Uh, you know, Ford cars. Ford cars, yes. Yeah. And uh, he was like first starting like building uh, cheap cars, like mass-produced cars. Mm -hmm. And his famous saying is that if I would ask my users what they need. <laughs> faster courses, not making cars, because for users it was like inconvenient, you need to fuel your car, you need oil, and it's like noisy, and I'm like uh, riding horse in my entire life. And the same thing happens when you're asking your user for opinion on your interface. Maybe you will agree with the interface, but because the way our mind works, uh, people don't like a uh, new thing, of course, even if they like more convenient and better. And uh, it was a such small focus group, like three person uh, per like, set of interviews, and uh, not letting them engage for a longer time, like for months, you create users from adapt to a better world. So, have you considered this? Like, mm, of course, of people? course. It's uh, it's always a pain point, right? Of course, uh, people are gonna dislike your product at times. When that happens, right? Obviously, you know there's a problem. But maybe sometimes they are apprehensive about it. They might be like. Mm. You know, so you might want to dig deeper and ask them why. But we found that having a clear product direction, where you want your product to be, you have a you know product vision, mission, whatever, right? You know, where if you have that, and you have your user feedback, and you have your gut feeling, I think you you make the right decision. So sometimes yes, you sometimes have to make a decision based on what you know, your experience. Whose gut feeling is uh, like most important? So we have many people in your company. <laughs> probably they have different guts. <laughs> <laughs> correct, so correct. Then, like, 
who make the final decision? Like, who's got the feeling of work? In general, right, we always say our users make the final decision. <coughs> and prevent it from innovation. Yes. Sometimes gives us good innovation too. Um, but in general, we listen to our users. But sometimes we look at numbers. Sometimes we ask our team members. Sometimes the boss just makes a decision, executive. So I think it takes a lot of uh, steps before we reach boss part, you know. But no, that's uh, how it, it could go. Mm. Like you know, throwing a dice and say, oh, if it's a six, then it goes there. Mm. Usually I find that a lot we can always solve this problem with uh, good product direction. So if users tell you like they want to do this because of that, then I say, you know, that's not, not really something we want to do. So this this th we usually can filter a lot of this, maybe if you want a number, right? More than ninety percent. It it rarely reaches the executive decision part, rarely. From my experience. So we yes. come to the end of the session. Cool. Yeah, the pizza is here, so you head towards the auditorium. You see at a, along the long table. Yep. And the next session is at one twenty, so you can like put on plates and then go to a different breakout rooms.